All right. Well, Bruce is uh, walking up here, and I, I want to say a few words before he gets here. I I uh, have known Bruce for uh, just about 41 or two years. He's, yeah, a long time, many decades. You know, I, I was noticing, too, Bruce, both you and I look more and more like our fathers. Have you noticed that? Yeah. Yeah. It's scary. God, I don't know what happened. <laughs> So anyway, uh, Bruce's brother and mine were in debate at the University of South Dakota. They got to know each other, and then uh, uh, they were both a year older than, than us, and they became roommates, and at the same time, then we became roommates uh, in our sophomore years of college at the University of South Dakota in Vermilion. And so I've known Bruce and Sharon, his wife, for all those years, and we have remained in touch. And, and uh, Bruce used to work for the uh, foundation for the United Methodist Church, the National Church, uh, raising money. And so about a year ago, he came, and uh, I gathered some of the pastors, the United Methodist pastors from up and down the valley, and we met with Bruce and then uh, found out at that point in time that he was writing a book and and I said I'd be great if you would come back and do a workshop for us and and then maybe preach on a Sunday and so he and Sharon figured out how to do that and that's why they're here today and so I just want to say uh, appreciate you so much for taking uh, time out of your schedule to come out here and be with us over the course of the, the last few days so appreciate it very much ladies and gentlemen Dr. Bruce Bloomer <clears throat> Well, it's really a joy to be with you this morning. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about our book and a little bit about our work that we do in Haiti before the sermon. Um, I have good news and good news about my book. Um, all the books that I brought are gone, uh, but the good news is you know, there's a sign-up sheet back there. My wife Sharon will be there, and if you sign up, we'll send books to the church, and um, and then they can distribute it to them. All the profits from the book we give to our ministry in Haiti, and uh, we actually we've been able to donate about $8,000 from the book already, and so um, you've made that possible. Um, we came here a couple days ago. My wife and I have been exploring your beautiful state, and so we went south, we've been north, went all over the place. So we've really been a great, we've been a great visit. Um, I wanted to show you just a little bit about the work that we do in Haiti because, uh, uh, again, the profits from the book go to support that. So, guys, if you want to run the video, please. We were here on the island during the big earthquake in 2010. In fact, we weren't very far away from the school. I came back in 2011 by myself and I visited about five villages around here in, on Sagale and five small villages around. I just asked pastors and teachers and elderly and people, anybody that, could, that would talk to me, I just said, what, are the, what do you need? And it overwhelmingly came back is that we really need support in the areas of education, healthcare, and how difficult life is for women, children, and the elderly. And so we just started small. Um, we started with a handful of school scholarships. We um, tried to buy medicine for clinics. We got started a small feeding program for the elderly, and then it just just continued to grow. You know, God has really blessed us and and our ability to continue down the path. And so we've we've tried to really stay to those core issues. Just that there's so many issues that we could deal with, but we really try to stay to the core of education, healthcare, and how we can support women, children, and the elderly. Well, the choir that you hear at the end of the video is actually in a, in a Methodist church in Haiti. And so um, I'd just like you to know that worship services are about two and a half or three hours. So buckle in. I hope you don't have lunch plans. We're going to be here a while. Um, we, uh, we're really grateful to, to have opportunities to speak like this. We, we have a clinic, which you saw in there. The school is at the end of May, and I think they'll, yep, they'll show, throw it up here. We actually put a roof on the, on the real shortly. That video was shot in May, and since then we put a roof on there. Um, we have grades one through five, and we're hoping to add one grade a year until we get up to grade one through eight. And so we have a roof. Um, we don't have the doors and windows figured out yet, and we have a, um, we'll, that'll come in due time. But we have a clinic, and our doctor works there. We, 
feed. We have some feeding programs, and um, again, we're just grateful to be uh, able to share a little bit about our program uh, that we do in Haiti, and now I'll, I'll share the message with you. The scripture verse that I'm using today comes from 2 Corinthians 12, verses 8 through 10. <clears throat> Three times I pleaded to the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I shall boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest in me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in my weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. You know, one of the big themes in this scripture verse is that of grace. And we banter that around in church a lot, don't we? The choir just sang about grace. We had it in the scripture verse. We've talked about it in the prayers this morning. Well, grace very simply is the love of God. It's the undeserved, unmerited love of God, and it's available from God despite how we've lived or what we've done. I grew up in a small town, and in that small town, there was a creek that ran through the town, and I'm pretty sure there's an electromagnet between kids and creeks, and we were down exploring the creek. It was springtime, so the creek was flowing pretty fully, but it was still cold out. We had our parkas and snow pants and snow boots, and there was this old bridge that extended out over the creek. Now, I know this will shock some of you, given what a physical specimen that I am today, but I was kind of a chubby kid. And the theory was, if the bridge holds the fat kid, it'll hold the rest of us. Well, it did hold for a while, and then I fell in the creek. And I remember being completely under the water and trying to struggle to the surface, and I, I really distinctly remember thinking, this is probably not a good thing. I did get to the surface, and I got on the shore on the other side, and the, and the town whistle went off. Now, if you didn't grow up in a small town, you might not know what that meant. It meant it was supper time. But what it meant for me was I was in big trouble. Grandma had come to visit, and the last thing that mom said is, you better not be late for supper. And so I made a very poor decision. I tried to swim across the creek. But it's hard to swim in snow pants and snow boots and gloves and hats. And I struggled to get out of the same side of the creek again. And my only option was to walk to the road bridge about a half a mile away and then walk home. And I'm trudging home and I'm thinking, man, I am in such trouble. And when I got home and mom saw this frozen, frightened kid peering out through this icy winter garb, she gave me a big hug and warmed me up and gave me something to eat. I think this is an illustration of grace. We test God. We go under. We get pushed away from God. We make really poor decisions. Sometimes we walk way far away from God. And what we expect when we try to come back to God, we might expect anger or judgment. But what we receive is the warm embrace. I really believe that God tries to extend grace to us if we'll simply be open. If you ever been in church and you thought, I'm not really sure why anybody else is here. I think Pastor Rusty wrote that sermon for me. Or if you read something in a book and thought, I needed that. Or is the right song at the right time come up on the radio? Or maybe you've received a call or an email or a visit from a friend and you thought, that was grace extended from God. You know, this past year, I had a zero birthday. Pretty big number. But I'd been riding my bike quite a bit, and I decided that I was going to ride 60 miles for my 60th birthday. So the week of my birthday, I looked at the forecast and tried to see, find the morning that was forecasted to have the least amount of wind, because if you're in South Dakota, you know we have an abundance of that. And so I got up, and I was beginning on my trek, and, you know, I wasn't feeling that well that morning, and I hadn't ridden for about a week, and I began to stack up the excuses of why I'm probably not going to make 60 miles for my 60th birthday. Early on in the end of my trip, a pastor friend pulled alongside me. I hadn't seen him in a while. We, it was nice to catch up. We just chatted a little bit, and I said, hey, ride on. I'm pacing myself today. And he said, no, let's just ride. And pretty soon, about 20 miles had evaporated. And as he pulled off to go home, I said, you know, I'm pretty sure God put you alongside me today. And I know I would not have made 60 miles if he'd not come alongside me. I think God asks us and wants us to come alongside others. I can't tell you how many times I've thought of a person 
And then I reached out to them with an email or a call, and they said something was going on in their life. I think when we submit to God is when we find power in God. Here's a scripture verse today, and Paul is pleading to God. The reference to three times was just to emphasize how much he wanted God to intervene. Now, in the verse just prior to the one that I read, he talks about Paul is talking about a thorn that he wants removed from his side. And it's thought that that thorn was actually probably referring to chronic illnesses that he dealt with. There was speculation that it might have been epilepsy or severe headaches or eye problems. But quite likely, where Paul lived and the time that Paul lived, it was quite likely malarial fever. Between my junior and senior year of high school, I went to Ghana, which is in West Africa. At the end of my three months there, I developed malaria. I know why Paul was pleading to God. I know why Paul wanted that thorn to be removed from his side. But I think God answered Paul's prayers, much like God answers our prayers. That God doesn't always spare us those things, but what God does give us is the strength to conquer and endure and overcome those things that confront our lives. And sometimes what we discover is that God was right there alongside us the entire way. Well, this past year, I've been putting a book together called Simply Grace, Everyday Glimpses of God. And what I try to do in the book is just to simplify grace and to make us all realize that we have grace in our everyday lives. I also try to tell through my stories and the stories of others. One of the real blessings that, I, that happened to me when I was putting the book together, I was thinking about my faith journey. And what I realized is my faith journey isn't your journey or yours or yours. That we all see God and seek God in very different ways. That we all have very different life and faith experiences. So at the end of every chapter, I put what I call simply grace stories. Who are people who had very different stories from mine. People who faced insults and hardships, and persecution, and difficulty, but found Christ's power came to them through those weaknesses. So you'll read about, um, you'll read about a man who, or people who lost family members. You'll read about a man who was living in a car in a junkyard, a man who was in prison for selling meth, a woman who was assaulted by her father, very different stories than mine, but allowed that Christ to come through their weaknesses and allow God to eventually come alongside them despite all of their different journeys. You know, there's a pretty famous guy in the United Methodist Church. You probably heard of him. His name is John Wesley. John Wesley was a prolific preacher. He preached about 15 sermons a week. They calculated over 40,000 sermons during his ministry. I talked to Pastor Rusty. He said he's just right below 40,000, just right underneath there. You know, they also calculated that he covered 250,000 miles in his ministry. And this isn't the time of Lear jets and cars. This is the time of horseback and on foot. Well, John Wesley came up with these categories of grace. And don't be intimidated by the words. They're really, truly simple concepts. The first is called provenient grace. And when you hear the word provenient, just think convenient. It's like that convenience store that's on every corner. It's those sermons and nudges, and songs, and things you've read, those contacts that you feel were divinely ordained. It's God's love that is constant, and waiting, and patient. You know, there are many religious traditions that don't baptize people until they're able to make their own faith tradition. Uh, and so you may wonder, then I'm at this church, why, why would we end, uh, baptize infants? It's largely because of provenient grace. Wesley be, believed that you are already loved. And there is nothing you can do to earn that love. So we as parents are simply accepting the provenient grace that God has already given us. Well, the second category is called justifying grace. And when you hear the word justifying, just think testifying. You're testifying to a change. You ask God for forgiveness of your sins and that you want to live differently. Some refer to it as a conversion experience or being born again or a new life. You are testifying to a change. Then the final category is called sanctifying grace. And when you hear the word sanctifying, just think steps. That you're trying to move into a new relationship with God. And what are the steps that you're going to take in this lifelong journey where we're perfecting our relation and connection with God? 
Well, Wesley came up with these, the image of a house to try to explain the stages of grace. And he thought that the Praveni grace was sort of like the porch. It's conveniently located, the house. Maybe we hang out there a while. Maybe we lay in the hammock. But it is conveniently located to the house of God. Then justifying grace is like the doorway. It's sort of like God has hung up a large welcome sign, and he's asking you to take a step across the threshold and to testify to a change in your life. Then sanctifying grace is like the rooms of the house. And here's the ways that we can explore our relationship with God in what he called the means of grace. And there's simple things that you already know and you already do, like prayer and reading scripture and fasting, which I'm not very good at, and attending worship, and sharing communion, and doing good works to address the needs of the world. Well, Wesley called prayer the chief means of grace, meaning that's how we access God and access grace is through prayer. I think the way that we begin to access God is through prayer, but also creating space for God. Now, if I'm completely honest, I'm not really sure how prayer works, but I do know these things. I know that it fits into every stage of our walk, from those rote bedtime or table prayers that are building this tradition of prayer, to the first time that we think about God and what might God mean in our life, to those times that we're pleading to God to have that thorn removed from our side. I also know more than anything that sometimes prayer changes us. It changes our attitude in the way that we deal with others. It's really hard to be angry with someone if you're praying for them. A friend a few years ago turned me towards breath prayers, that when you hear or you think about someone, just offer them up in a prayer that takes as long as it takes one breath. I also think that prayer gives us that nudge to come alongside others. So when you feel that, uh, that urge to contact someone, do it. When you feel that you should take on a project or volunteer, take that step. When you feel that it's time to forgive or to intervene or to let go, act on it. Maybe, just maybe, that's God trying to work through us if we'll simply allow it. I came across this from the John Trapp commentary, and I really like it. They encourage us to pray frequently and fervently, but provide us this guidance. God doesn't respect the arithmetic of our prayers, how many there are. Not the rhetoric of our prayers, how neat they are. Nor the geometry of our prayers, how long they are. Nor the music of our prayers, how melodious they are. But prayers that are sprung from the heart. It's not the number or the neatness or the length or the sound that God cares about. What God cares about are prayers that come from our hearts. Simple Honest conversations with God is where God's grace and love will prevail. This last summer, our youngest son was married, and it was really a fun week. It was fun to catch up with friends and family, and the evening of their wedding was an absolute beautiful South Dakota evening that we have once every four or five years, it seems like. Well, a couple days before the wedding, I'd gone out to pick up some items, and I get a call from my daughter-in-law to be, and she wants me to pick up brown mascara. Wow. Now, I've realized if you're a woman, you'll probably be rolling your brown mascara enhanced eyes, but if you're a guy and you want to spend one of the most confusing and perplexing moments of your life, go to a makeup aisle and find something specific like brown mascara. You know, our lives are going to have confusing and perplexing moments. We're going to have enjoyable and grateful moments. We are going to have difficult and trying moments that challenge all of us. But I ask you to lift up your fears and your failures, your greatest celebrations and those toughest things to forgive, to simply give them up in a heartfelt, simple prayer, and know that every one of those prayers is safely rested within God's love and in within God's grace. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness, this, my friends, is the Christian paradox, that when we see ourselves as weak, we have to go out of ourselves and receive strength from God. How often do we boast about our weaknesses? Hey, world, I am so terrible at you fill in the blank. 
But Christ allows us to delight in our weaknesses because it means that then we have allowed God to become our strength. It is then that we can push aside insults and persecutions and hardships and difficulties because we've allowed simply grace to rule our lives. Will you pray with me? Loving and grace-filled God, put someone in my way today. Put me in someone's way today. God, give us the strength to conquer and endure and overcome the issues that confront our lives because we know it is your grace and your peace and your light that will then shine through our weaknesses. Amen. Thank you, Bruce. It has been a grace to me that you have been with us these last few days. And so, uh, appreciate very much you being here with us. Thank you.